Thank you. Um, Philip Baumgartner, University of Bonn. Um, thanks for three stimulating presentations. Um, my comment or my question goes to uh, Margaret. Um, I liked your findings that growth brought even more employment in the rural areas, if I got it right. And you said women in urban areas are particularly bad off. Mm, one thing that came to my mind was how did you um, include informality of employment in urban areas? Maybe you could elaborate on that later. Hi, can you hear, uh, can you hear me? Hi. Um, thank you for your question and your interest. Um, the short answer is the DHS data don't distinguish between informality and formality. So the good news is that we have everybody. The bad news is that we can't tell the difference. But it's better than having only one, <laughs> right? So. Oh, my paper online. Which one? Um, yeah, I have. Okay. Yeah, the question was on the conference site. I was looking for your paper. Oh, I didn't find yeah. it on some. There is you, no are you paper. I have some papers. I'll put something there plus okay. my slides. But the DHS data, we haven't written it up yet. Okay. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, Matthew Powell. Uh, Matthew Powell, Oxford. Uh, um, I, th I think this uh, is all very interesting research, but um, this sort of style of analysis, uh, as it's presented here, only really takes you so far because if you have a movement from a low productivity sector to a high productivity sector um, and uh, without a fall in the, high, uh, the productivity and the high productivity sector, that's, that's not really a cause of economic growth. That's a pattern of economic growth. It's a, it, it is the economic growth. And to actually get the causation in, you have to move back and say, well, why can you do that? Why could it happen? And I wondered if you could say something about it, your research programs and how they address that particular. Uh, um, uh, can I answer right away or do I have to wait? <laughs> I'm just going to answer right away. OK. so. Um, so uh, obviously, yeah, you're 100%, you're 150% 100 right, if that's possible. Um, so um, that there are a couple of things. In, in, um, in an earlier paper, a background paper for the African Economic Outlook, I, I um, <clears throat> included a lot of different political variables from the, um, oh, what's the name of that guy? Um, the Mohi Ibrahim index. I, I included those variables to try to tease out whether any there was any correlation between governance indicators and um, in, in structural change, and there there was some correlation. And um, the next step, actually, um, I, I need to be a little careful because we haven't talked about it fully with my co-authors, but. Um, it's pre we have a research assistant who's just constructed a, a series of commodity prices for us, so we can um, look at the extent to which commodity pri price changes are driving. There are a couple of ways to go about it. I don't know. Do we want to? We could instru We have an endogeneity problem, so could we instrument GDP growth with um, commodity prices? But it's complicated. So we, or we can include commodity prices directly in the regression to see to what extent they're changing things. We already have the political variable there. We should probably include something to do with conflict. Um, so that's one route we can go down. And then, then the other route to go down, I think, um, is more detailed country level studies. Uh, oh, well, yes, like Robert's study, but even more, um, even more storytelling. So, um, so a, a separate line of research that I'm involved in, but that I, th that I think is related and um, really interesting because it's much more micro is, for example, uh, in Ethiopia, um, there's been a ton of investment, a ton, there's been a lot of investment by the Chinese, particularly in the leather industry, and they're exporting now designer shoes, le you know, leather d designer shoes. And so it's interesting to understand the consequences of that, but it's also interesting to understand 
how that came about. And a, a lot of it has to do with um, personalities at the top. So that's not very satisfying from an economist's perspective. But yeah, yeah you know, it's fascinating questions, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, maybe I can take this opportunity. I do have a, uh, a quick question for Marcus. And of course, I have not had a chance to read your uh, paper. But what wasn't entirely clear to me was whether you uh, specified, postulated one uh, production function in agriculture. Uh, because if that is the case, uh, it seems to me that uh, it may well be an extreme assumption. Um, at one time, I looked at the evolution of uh, production, of agricultural production within the case of Taiwan over a 20, 25 year uh, period. And it started as an essentially almost totally labor intensive technology. And gradually uh, they started uh, moving in some uh, uh, agricultural implements uh, uh, that, that uh, increased the, the land productivity, labor productivity. But this was a, a very gradual process but clearly 20, 25 years later, the technology had become significantly more capital intensive. So my question to you is, um, am I correct in, in understanding that what you did was to postulate one unique production function? If so, I would have some, some reservations. Thanks a lot. That's a, that's a great question, and it's the, it's the usual curse of dimensionality for me. So what, what we do in this research, we say, um, the existing literature thinks that agricultural production is identical in 1950 Ghana and 2010 Taiwan. Everything is the same everywhere, always. Same alpha, same beta. So what do we do? We change the alpha to alpha I. We relax the assumption that every single country has the same function. Um, and, and we can do that. Um, so, so from my perspective, I would say one, one defense against uh, this kind of suggestion is um, we can say these are movements along the production plane, let's call it. Um, so initially, capital stock was extremely low. Later on, it was much, much higher. This would be kind of a, a, a non-empirical defense. An empirical defense would be to say, okay, let's, if we have long enough data, we can look at we can look at the beginning and, and then towards the end. We can compare whether we, if we analyze a kind of a moving window of data, whether we can see a change in this production frontier or this production technology. And uh, for uh, uh, one of the papers I mentioned, that's, that's exactly what we did, and we found them to be comparatively stable. I think, and, and I know this is your area of expertise, um, I, I, I think these sort of environmental impacts on what is possible in agricultural production or what is feasible um, is, uh, is, is, is very important in this context. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, just two brief questions to um, Dr. Robert Ose on his presentation on Ghana. Um, I'm just wondering whether you could throw a little bit more light on what you mean by um, indicating that the cocoa sector has declined. I mean, is the decline in relative or absolute terms? I mean, given the fact that cocoa production has increased quite substantially um, in Ghana since the um, early 2000s. And secondly, I'm also just wondering whether your paper considered the implications of um, the sectoral patterns of growth um, for issues of inequality in Ghana. Thanks, uh, Abdul. Um, no, so what I meant with respect to the cocoa sector was the relative share, its contribution to GDP. So that has declined, irrespective of the fact that we've achieved the highest uh, in the country's history with respect to uh, the output. Um, now, the second question I wasn't too clear. The question was, of 
Groovehand. I'm just wondering whether you looked at the implications or the impact of that on the patterns of inequality that we are observing in Ghana now. Okay, yes, uh, in indeed. Um, so we further do the analysis by regions where we split the country into three uh, zones and then look at the movements uh, with respect to resources across the three uh, regions. Uh, so, but also even with respect to the sectorial um, productivity changes, um, you remember the, the, one of the points I made earlier with respect to why I thought Ghana was interesting was essentially what the implications of that part of growth is for employment. And so, for instance, if you do observe um, a reallocation of uh, resources from, say, agriculture to the retail trade sector, which, uh, in essence, isn't a relatively high productivity uh, sector, the question is whether that is a path that A, is sustainable, um, uh, but B, with respect to inequalities, whether it does help at all with respect to inequalities. Um, my submission is that probably it doesn't. Okay, of course, the fact that the tourism sector has become relatively more important, uh, reallocation of resources to the tourism sector is a positive. Okay, it's a positive um, generally with respect to the tourism sector because also the tourism sector um, has um, relatively high um, productivity. Okay. So we do look at what the implications are for inequality and employment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> any, any other questions, comments? Yes, please. My name is Imran Velodia. This is, this is a question to Robert. Uh, so I, I was just wanting to know how you've how you've uh, how you've dealt with the informal sector in Ghana is that is that completely out of your story, or um, is all of that employment sitting in the services sector? So um, how have you handled the informal? No, um, for uh, yes, like I said, we've we've done a disaggregation by uh, sectors with respect to the employment. Uh, uh, movements and then you can then relate that to uh, the productivity changes that have occurred across the different sectors. And so if you look at the retail trade sector, the retail trade sector is typically, at least for Ghana, uh, the sector which is highest with respect to uh, informality. Okay, so moving, of course, our Greek is also traditionally classified as informal. So while labor is actually moving from a Greek um, to the relatively low productivity informal sector, um, essentially you are juggling uh, the balls, but the core of the structure of the economy in terms of how um, things are done generally hasn't changed, okay? So people have stopped farming and then they are now selling the, the pauper on the streets. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I guess we are all getting uh, hungry, and uh, I, uh, but I don't want to close the session until I'm sure that we have exhausted uh, every opportunity for you to ask uh, questions or make comments. But if I, if I don't see any, uh, it, it, did, did you want to have the final question, please? Final question, yes. It's about um, the, uh, the first paper. I, I just, um, it would help me, I don't know, maybe it would help other people in the room, if you were to explain a little about the correlation between the labor shares and the climatic zone. The idea that in South Korea um, there was, for some climatic reason, Agriculture was particularly capital intensive, whereas in Ghana it was particularly labor intensive. That's what sets them on a particular path, a uh, particular response. Is that the picture? Well, and if so, so then what, what's the connection between thanks. the climate and the capital? Yeah, great question. But what, what we mustn't confuse is 
is the technology with the labor or capital intensity. So um, all, all that we observe, and, and we are very, very cautious about this correlation um, because we don't want to talk about geographical uh, predeterminism. So, um, but but um, um, all, all that we try and show with these patterns in the data, if we plug them into a, stand, a, a, a very basic and stylized model of how structural change works, um, we notice that there's very, very qu significant quantitative differences in terms of uh, whether you seem to be in a, in a high labor coefficient environment or in a low labor uh, coefficient environment. And, and, and in a way, that's, that's uh, trying to excuse uh, people who who say, well, we can't just be the next South Korea. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of other political economy reasons why South Korea was incredibly successful. But um, um, just taking that as the sort of gold standard, the best you could do in terms of structural change, um, it would not be possible if, if Ghana, for instance, had the same level of technological progress, if it had the same level of uh, uh, population growth and the same level of increase in wages, uh, of course, these are all endogenous to a certain extent, but it would still not achieve the same level of trans structural transformation and, and income um, after 40 years. So it's, it's, it's important to, to notice that countries are different. And, um, and, and if I can take that as an opportunity, I wanted to ask Maggie. Um, so you, you're using these large micro-level data sets now. And I know my micro friends in the room know that you're on, on to the path, the holy grail, um, <laughs> because micro is better. But, but here's my question. So I have 900 observations in my, in my data, data set, and I use regressions that are based on, say, 30, because I do it country by country. You have in the hundreds of thousands of observations in your, in your data set across a very diverse set of African economies. If you are a policy advisor, and I think that's ultimately what you, you have to be, what is your recommendation based on these hundreds of thousands of observations from an incredibly diverse set of countries? Um, what is your policy advice to that one single politician? Are we not better off to doing just case studies? Why do we bother with these cross-country analyses? Um, well, you know what? I have a question for you, too. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, um, I'm actually going to... Um, put you off for a minute because um, um, because I have we have not gotten to the point at which we're talking about policy recommendations this is work in progress I'm just describing what's going on in, in the data and first understanding what's happening y you need to do that before um, before um, before you can make policy recommendations having said that in the macro regressions when I pull all the um, there, there are a variety of things I can do. I could do it country by country, no problem. Uh, I have country fixed effects, um, um, and so we, one thing we can do is, um, and even with the country fixed effects, the socioeconomic things and the GDP are important, but I could go country to country and run the same regressions and see. I mean, I, I, I'm betting you anything. I, I would bet my first born son, and I don't have one, on the fact that I, I would see the coefficients look similar for every country, but that's easy to check. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, but can I ask a question about your paper? No, we, actually, let's please be very. I it, mean, we we it, are now at 20 minutes till. It will 12, take. It will so. be very quick. But in that slide where you had a beta, uh, you know, but what is beta? The share of. The share of labor. In that in. In the technology. So in the technology. technology. To the power of e. okay, okay, so one thing I found really confusing about that slide is. You, you pointed out these huge differences in productivity, but the differences in consumption are minimal. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I glossed over that. There are two consumption variables there. Okay. One, is, one is consumption of agricultural goods. Yeah. The other one is consumption of non-agricultural goods. So uh, following Engels, you know, we, we now we consume, what, 5% of our income in terms of agricultural goods? And, and the, so, so, therefore, across these three different scenarios, there was very, very little difference um, because people don't 
consume food once they get much richer. But there was a vast difference. The South Koreans, they use Samsung phones and, and Hyundai cars. The Ghanaians, unfortunately, still eat most of their income. So you're very right. The agricultural consumption was flat across these three scenarios. Non-agricultural was very far from flat. Oh, I have to say one more thing. It'll only take two seconds. Oh, and for the thing about policy, so um, actually, one thing that's, that's, that I think is important, so for example, in those regressions, the, this issue of youth unemployment comes out hu hugely important and a big problem, and it's common to all countries. So that's an important fact for policymakers to know. It's something that African policymakers can, can rally around together, you see? Well, I have the, the final word, and of course I want to uh, thank the uh, presenters for some very interesting and, and, and challenging uh, presentations. Um, I, I've always felt that uh, uh, it was the resource endowment of a country that to a large extent predetermined the type of uh, technology that uh, would be used. So I, I, I've never, and Hayami was one of my students, you, you know, <laughs> I'm old enough to, uh, That's amazing. To, to, but anyway, my first job uh, was at uh, Iowa State University and Hayami was uh, getting his PhD there. So I've, I've talked to him a lot about it, but I've never been convinced with the idea that you can have a, a super production function that accommodates any type of resource endowment. But that's a, you know, th You're this is You're supporting me, actually. Okay, good. So, 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 you may not so, know it. Good. But anyway, thanks uh, to, to the presenters, and also thank you very much for the uh, incisive questions. Uh, and I think we've uh, passed the, uh, the deadline, and we all deserve to have a nice lunch.